I'm Matt Lyon. This is Thoracic Ultrasound, Part 2. In this lecture, we'll be looking at artifacts arising from the pleural. A 64-year-old male has come in for your evaluation. He has acutely short of breath. He has no history of trauma. It started suddenly, and he's complaining of left-sided chest pain. So how do we want to use thoracic ultrasound to help with the differential diagnosis in this patient? As we talked about before, we use a systematic approach. We place our probe across the ribs, we identify the ribs, then we identify the pleura. Once we've identified the pleura, we look for movement of the pleura. Once we've identified the movement, then we look for artifacts arising from the pleura. Here is our patient's ultrasound. We're using a curvilinear abdominal probe. We've placed it on the patient's chest. It is across the ribs. We've identified our ribs, our pleural surface. It is moving. And then we see an artifact arising from the pleura and going off the screen. What is this artifact? This is called a reverberation artifact. It is also called a comet tail artifact. It is also called beelines. Generally, I would rather for you to learn that this is a reverberation artifact and it is indicative of an air fluid interface, generally on a microscopic level. If it was a large air fluid interface, it would be a pleural effusion. This is on the microscopic level, and this is thickening of the septa of the alveoli with fluid, and it causes an artifact known as a comet tail artifact. You can look at the normal lung over here, and you can see that the pleura is very bright, and there's very little artifact coming below it. On the abnormal one, we can see that there is a comet tail artifact due to this air-water interface, and it causes an artifact that goes all the way off the screen. Again, this is a reverberation artifact or a comet tail artifact, and it's the ultrasound equivalent of a curly B line. This is where it gets the name of B line, and it indicates interstitial edema. Now, it doesn't tell you what the interstitial edema is from. It could be from cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It could be from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or ARDS, or it can be from pneumonia. You have to use other information to tell the difference between these three. Now, to be a comet tail artifact and mean that there's an air-water interface in the lungs or B lines, you must meet certain criteria. The first one is, is that the artifact, these lung rockets, these vertical lines, must arise from the pleural line. So if it does not arise from the pleural line, it is not an air-water interface indicative of a B line. There must also not be horizontal lines. In normal lung, you can have a reverberation artifact where you have multiple horizontal lines going deeper onto the ultrasound screen. If those are present, along with vertical lines, the vertical lines are not B lines or comet tail artifact. A lines can be normal. A B line will erase a normal A line. Also, because these artifacts are dependent on pleural movement, because we're looking at the lung, they move with pleural movement. Therefore, there's a rhythmic sliding with respirations of these B lines, as we see here in the image. And they must go all the way off the screen. One reason why we have the depth so deep at 13 centimeters is to show you that they go all the way off the screen. There are other vertical lines that can be seen in thoracic ultrasound. And they can be confused with lung rockets or this comet tail art artifact we've been talking about. For it to be a comet tail artifact, they must go all the way off the screen. If you get ill-defined vertical lines as we see here in this image that do not go off the screen, then it is not a comet tail artifact. And I cannot tell you the clinical entity that is associated with those lines. Now, an the important point about looking for beelines is, is that ultrasound machines typically try to reduce the amount of artifact present in the image. Therefore, there is processing that takes away artifacts that we are looking for. If we look at the image on the left, we can see our beelines or our comet tail artifacts that start at the pleura and go all the way off the screen. On the image on the right, it is the exact same person in the exact same location, but we cannot see those artifacts as well. Every once in a while we see one that comes off the screen, but it is a little bit more difficult to see. And that is because the image on the right has multi-beam or compound imaging turned on, as well as tissue harmonic imaging. Both of these modes decrease the amount of artifacts that are seen after the image has been displayed. So if you want to have the classic appearance of lung rockets, you may have to turn off your multi-beam or compound imaging, as well as your tissue harmonic imaging. All right, so we talked about lung rockets. 
and they ind indicate interstitial edema. And when you think interstitial edema, think of fluid in the alveoli. This is not exactly the case. It's really fluid in the interstitial septa, but if you think of it as fluid in the alveoli, it helps you with your differential diagnosis. So it could be fluid backing up in the lungs from cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It could be a process like non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema like ARDS. It could be because of an inflammatory response due to a pneumonia or a pulmonary contusion and there's blood instead of just fluid that are in the alveoli. Or it could be due to pleural disease, which we'll cover later in the lecture. The location and history are the keys to differentiate between these differential diagnoses. So you have to know what the patient's position is now. You have to know where the probe is currently and where you found the artifacts. And you have to know what position they have been in for the last several hours to a couple of days. So let's try this. Here's our 64-year-old male, and he comes in with acute shortness of breath. So you want to know where is the probe. You also want to know what position is this person in, and then you may need to confirm everything. Okay? So where's the probe? The probe is at the base, and you find lots of lung rockets on both sides. And as you move up the back, the lung rockets become less and less numerous. So in this example, near the base, we see lots of lung rockets. There are so many of them in each intercostal space that we can't even count them. And as we move up, it becomes less and less until it's three, then we move up a rib two, then we move up a rib, it's one, then we move up a rib, and there's none towards the apex. That means that there's more fluid towards the base, and it gets less as you move up towards the back, because the number of lung rockets is proportional to the amount of fluid that is in the interstitial septa or in the alveoli. So what was the patient doing before they came in? Well, they were ambulatory. Well, this makes sense. So they were walking around, fluid is heavier than the air, so it's settled into the bases. That tells us that this is dependent edema, all right? Now, we would like to use some other test to confirm what our suspicion is. We think that this patient who comes in with acute chest pain and shortness of breath has dependent pulmonary edema. What other exam could we combine to make the diagnosis? Well, I like using cardiac and IVC to confirm my thoracic ultrasound. So if we had a patient that came in with dependent pulmonary edema, we thought it was CHF, and we looked at the IVC, it should be big and dilated, which we see here. That means the central venous pressure is high, which is what we imagined it would be. Then if we looked at the left ventricle, as we see here, we can see that the ejection fraction is greatly diminished. So if we put all of this together, we can say this patient looks like they have congestive heart failure. One of the problems with thoracic ultrasound is people try and take it in isolation. You should always integrate the thoracic ultrasound into your clinical acumen. So ultrasound has three components, image acquisition, image interpretation, and then clinical integration. You can't use one ultrasound image to put all of this together in isolation. You have to ask the patient questions, you have to know a little bit about the patient, then you may have to add other, other ultrasound exams to increase your sensitivity as well as your specificity. So here's another case. 64 year old male comes in with acute shortness of breath, no history of trauma, it started suddenly, he's got left-sided chest pain and fever. How do we, we want to use thoracic ultrasound to help with this differential diagnosis? We place the probe across the ribs, we identify the ribs, we identify the pleural, we look for movement. Then we look for artifacts arising from the pleura. We see none here. Then we want to look deep to the pleura to see if that gives us any information. We are looking at the patient's ultrasound. We are using a phased array or cardiac probe to do this. Cardiac probes do not image the pleura very well because it is a very narrow field of view where the pleura are. So we don't see the pleura very well, but they are the hyperechoic line we see at the top of the screen. We see something that looks like lung rocket. But remember, we talked about lung rockets have to arise from the pleural line, and in this case, they do not arise from the pleural line. They are deep to the pleural line. In every other image we've seen so far, we don't really see anything that is lungs. We don't see anything that is lungs because the lungs are filled with air and we cannot image air. In this case, we see something. What is that something? Well, this is lung filled with pus. We can see that there is a consolidation or an infiltration of pus into the lungs, 
And the bright areas that we're seeing that cause the reverberation artifact, that type of lung rocket, are really air in the bronchioles, and that's really an air bronchogram. We can see these as punctate linear hyperechoic areas within the lung, and these are air-filled spaces within, that remain within the lung that has been filled with a fluid or pus. This is called hepatization of the lung. We can see in the CT image, we can see that the air on a CT is black, and it still remains in the bronchioles even though the lung has been infiltrated with fluid or pus. On the ultrasound, these air-filled spaces are hyperechoic because they're air-filled. Air is always bright and causes a dirty shadowing, which we can see here. You can generally see a reverberation artifact with this air-water interface or air-pus interface, and that can clue your eyes in that that is an abnormal lung, and in this case, this is a pneumonia. So this is one reason why I like to use phased array probe because it is a high contrast probe and it makes these artifacts stand out and very visible when I'm scanning very quickly. Now, for you to be able to see the hepatization of the lungs or the low bar pneumonia, the pneumonia must touch the pleura, the pericardium, or the diaphragm. It cannot have aerated lung around it and us see it. So if we look at the picture on the left, where our probe is, there is pus-filled lungs between our probe. We can see the pus-filled lungs because there is no air in between the pus and our probe. Therefore, we see the hepatization and the pneumonia. On the image on the right, we cannot see the pneumonia because it is deep and it has normal lung around it. Since it has normal lung around it, we cannot see through the aerated lung and we cannot see the pneumonia. But this is really not normal lung surrounding the pneumonia. There are inflammatory cells coming in to fight this pneumonia. So each one of those alveoli are not filled with pus, but they're filled with extra blood and mediators from the blood that help kill the infection, but they also dilate these septal walls and produce our lung rockets or reverberation artifact that we saw with the cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Therefore, if we're scanning and we find a non-dependent localized area where we have lung rockets in a patient that looks like they have pneumonia, we have probably found their pneumonia. So here's the key concept. Which probe do we want to use? The curvilinear or abdominal probe gives a good field of view, meaning we can see a lot of lung in one position of the probe. That's very good. And I use this as a general purpose probe. I scan with it frequently. But the phased array probe, which gives a very narrow field of view when you're looking at the pleura itself, gives you a higher contrast image, and it's better for the detection of these hyperechoic linear air-filled bronchi, which are indicative of hepatization of the lungs. Therefore, I generally scan people initially with the phased array or cardiac probe unless I'm looking for a pneumothorax. If I'm looking for a pneumothorax, I will use one of the other probes because it's better at looking at the pleura. But if I'm just looking for pneumonia or a pleural effusion or other non-pleural based diseases, I'll use the phased array or cardiac probe. Now the next big thing you need to know is how to localize the artifacts that you have found. When you look at a chest x-ray, you generally talk about the left having an uh, upper lobe and a lower lobe and the right having an upper lobe, middle lobe, and lower lobe. But in ultrasound, as we can see in the picture on the right, the upper lobe really is the anterior portion of the chest. So if I'm scanning the left chest and I find any artifacts on the anterior surface of the chest, then I think that that is going to be the upper lobe. If I'm scanning from the back, unless I'm way at the apex, if I find an artifact on the back, then that is the lower lobe. So I think of this more as the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe, more so than the upper lobe and the lower lobe. The right is even a little bit more complex because it has the middle lobe. So if I'm on the upper portion of the anterior chest, this would be the upper lobe. If I'm on the lower portion of the anterior chest, this is the middle lobe. And if I'm scanning from the back and I'm not at the apex, then it's the lower lobe. So I think of this as anterior and posterior and if you look the middle lobe comes around the side so I can look for the middle lobe along the side more towards the anterior chest. This is a little different than looking at a chest x-ray 
But being able to localize anterior and posterior and correlate that with upper, middle, and lower is very important. Now, we can see several things that cause alveolar consolidation. Atelectasis is one of these. And it can be confused with pneumonia. So let's talk about that just for a second. A crucial problem is distinguishing between obstructive atelectasis and a passive atelectasis caused by pleural effusion. The example we see below is passive atelectasis. We have a large amount of fluid that is squeezing the air out of the lungs. And when it does that, the lungs are compressed and we can see them floating in the fluid. We still see the hyperechoic opacities that we talked about before, which are air remaining in the bronchioles. On the image on the right, we have a pneumonia. It looks very similar, except that it is an expansive process because there is pus coming into the alveoli. Therefore, we may or may not see a pleural effusion with a pneumonia, but the lung itself is, is expanded. It can be difficult to tell the difference, though, between obstructive atelectasis, where the lung is not collapsed, but is infiltrated, versus a pneumonia which has pus infiltrating the alveoli. In obstructive atelectasis, the ultrasound image will demonstrate a scant pleural effusion generally, and the hypoechoic lung consolidations and focal lesions will lack movement during inspiration and exhalation. In other words, in a pneumonia, there is pus in the bronchioles, and it will move with respiration. This is called an air bronchogram, and the pus is moving in and out of the air bronchogram. If you have obstructive atelectasis, then the bronchioles are being obstructed, say, by a mass. Therefore, as you breathe in and out, there is no movement of air in and out of the bronchioles, so you get what is called a static air bronchogram. It can be difficult to tell the difference between a static air bronchogram and a dynamic air bronchogram. Therefore, always relate it back to your clinical history. If you have a patient coming in with fever and cough, and it sounds like they have a pneumonia, it's probably a pneumonia. If you have a person that has had a lot of weight loss and you're suspecting a lung cancer, then it's probably atelectasis. Now, occasionally when you're looking at a consolidation, you will see something in the consolidation. A hypoechoic area that does not match an anatomical structure would be very worrisome. In this case, we're looking at an abscess which is a hypoechoic, clearly defined area within the consolidation. It doesn't match an artery or a vein, and so you know that this is not a normal structure there. And in fact, this is liquefaction of the lungs, and this is an abscess. We can see it here on CT scan and on chest x-ray, and what we see really is an air fluid level. Not all abscesses will have an air fluid level. Some of them will only have a fluid that will move back and forth with respiration. So with ultrasound, we can see both of these. Here we see a hypoechoic area in a non-aerated lung or a, a lung that has been infiltrated by pus. We can see a hyperechoic linear structure in the hypoechoic area, and this is an air fluid level, and it's correlated to the CT scan of the patient over here. If it's fluid filled only like some of the lower abscesses in the lung, then you can't see this hyperechoic air fluid level in the lung. And what you have to look for is a fluid wave. And if you look, the ultrasound, the ribs are moving on the ultrasound back and forth. And so the lung below them should move in correlation with the ribs or the rib shadow. In this case, when they're moving, because of inertia, the two are not moving in sync, and this is a fluid wave inside the thoracic cavity. This is a abscess that has no flu air fluid interface, so it's all fluid. This can be very subtle. It can be very hard to see. Some tropical diseases will also form cysts in the lungs, and you can make this diagnosis with a variety of means, such as CT scan, but you may not have a CT scanner available. And on chest x-ray, it can be difficult to differentiate the mass into what it is. Now, we know that econococcal cysts have a double wall. And here we have a diaphragm-based pulmonary cyst that has a double wall. So we would feel fairly certain that this is an econococcal cyst if you were in an endemic area. Now, these cysts, if they're econococcus, will also follow the same grading scale as those found in the abdomen. 
So you can either follow the WHO classification for Aconococcus or the Garby classification. We can look in the lungs and this will follow the same pattern. Here we see a cystic mass in the lung and we can look and we can grade what this is. And this example is probably either transitional or moving towards inactive. This is the end of part two.